My name is William Smith. I'm the editor of Art in America magazine. Um, and I'm really thrilled today to be able to talk to Rochelle Feinstein, a painter, writer, teacher, an artist we've covered numerous times in Art in America over the years. Uh, most recently in a, a feature piece about uh, a traveling retrospective um, that started in, in Europe and came to the Bronx Museum in 2018. Um, you can see um, some of Rochelle's most recent work uh, at, on Speroni Westwater's uh, website. Uh, she has a beautiful exhibition in their online viewing room, um, a sign of the times, I suppose. Um, and actually, Rochelle, I think that's a really good place to start, um, is with uh, your, your recent work. And the show is called Recent Work, um, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and let me, let me bring up an image on the screen. Actually, one of the images that we use to promote um, this discussion, you can um, hopefully see it there in the corner of that stunning rainbow. Um, and it's, it's such an attractive image. Um, it really spoke to me. It, it really did um, provide a measure of solace, I, I would say, looking at that as, as perhaps sentimental as that sounds. So I'm wondering if you could, if you could talk about that imagery and um, how you came to it and um, mm -hmm. what you were thinking for this exhibition. Sure. Um, uh, this is a photograph. Um, it's one of, uh, of five images and they're all double rainbows. And uh, my intention wasn't initially to work with rainbows per se, but I saw the double rainbow and ran, ran out and started photographing it. But I was working on an exhibition at the time, uh, which ended up being called uh, Rainbow, Rainbow Room, The Year in Hate. Uh, so the photographic imagery um, was obviously digitized, redigitized. What interested me was the phenomena, or I'm, I'm interested in form. So that whole exhibition, as most of my exhibitions, some way are, are a kind of in, in exploration of uh, very common, commonly seen forms and to try and to get into meaning of these forms. And the rainbow obviously is an aspirational one. And as you said, you feel great when you see a rainbow, as I did when I when I saw this rainbow from, I think, eight different vantage points, I was chasing the rainbow, the double rainbow. And um, it occurred to me that given the time I was making these, which was in early 2018, um, I had already been working uh, with uh, the condition, the social political condition um, in, in the United States. And the rainbow seemed to uh, be very much something I could work with. Um, as an aspirational form. Um, other forms I'd worked with earlier were color wheels, some very, very familiar um, things. And so the, as you see in the wall there. Um, yeah, could, the, you, could you just explain what we're looking at? This is a section oh, of your studio, right? Oh now. yeah, this is the studio. I left the studio on March the 12th. And this was a shot, or March, this is, I think that shot taken then, uh, of a working wall in the studio. So I haven't, I've been back one time and took some more images. Uh, so that is the one of the images, and the sequence of images um, all use uh, in the former one um, the seven colors of the rainbow. So, which occurs in diagrams, um, it, it occurs in uh, climate climate mappings, uh, data data mappings, uh, and it seemed to be also a palette that I could really work with and and explore. So I've been committed to that palette. So this is there as a kind of a a signpost of, of the palette I'm working with, which is uh, red, orange, yellow, uh, green, well, anyway, it's like seven colors. Roy G. Biv, right? Roy G. Biv, exactly, yeah. one of the acronyms. So what you're looking at, are, this is also something I, I left, and the two pieces on the, on the left that are uh, kind of propped up there um, are examples of works that are use only those seven colors. Um, and it's intended to be a sequence of works in a rather extended format, which I work with often, not just one single piece, but a kind of um, cluster of works which uh, move together. So it's all based on the same palette, which is the rainbow palette. So and this, this, is, this is like a time capsule of your studio to some extent. It sure is, yeah. I took it to remember my studio. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I haven't been there in quite a while. 
Yeah, so this is another project I'm working on uh, on the floor that's being assembled, made and assembled someday. So the piece on the, on the far right, leaning up there, that is on the viewing, uh, the view, in the viewing room uh, at Speroni. And I've been working with uh, cardboard as well. I have a whole other Amazon uh, project I've been working on. So uh, that's a piece that also only uses those seven colors. And I'm interested in that, the aspirational versus the situational. Um, uh, and how do you contextualize that desire and the, the, perhaps the hope? Um, or you know, Queen Elizabeth just told children to draw rainbows uh, about a month ago. So it seems to be a universal uh, symbol of hope. And I'm not necessarily, um, I don't necessarily feel a lot of hope, but I'm, I'm definitely interested in the multiple uses of that palette. So, and you started working with this in 2018, um, but yeah. do, you, do you feel that um, for you, the meaning of this has changed now um, with the pandemic underway or? Uh, no, <laughs> I mean, I think what started for me is there's a paint earlier painting, it's called The Weak in Hate. Um, and I think the pandemic has, I mean, many, many meetings to all of us who are, um, who are really, we're all caught in it in our own ways, but together. Um, but this, this notion of the, the year in hate grew into another piece called, the, a large piece called The Year in Hate. And I think this, this essential, essential division uh, in the country, the polarities. Um, and so I'm working the rainbow and other things uh, to really trying to figure out myself how these polarities figure into um, my work without being overt. I guess that gets us right to a, a big question that I was, I was hoping we would have a little bit more <laughs> lead up to, but I feel like we're there right now. Okay. Um, which, you know, you're, you're talking about social and political conditions. You're talking about imagery that might be grounded in scientific diagrams and data visualizations. Mm -hmm. You're clearly responding to the context around you. Yeah. So what is the language of abstract painting doing in that sense? What, what is abstraction as a form allowing you to communicate? Well, <laughs> That's it. <laughs> See what I mean? And actually, be before you before you respond, I just want to um, let everyone know um, that um, you know there's a, a Q and A button at the bottom of the Zoom interface that um, you're, you're free to use, and I'm going to be looking at that um, throughout the discussion. Um, so please ask questions as they come up. Um, I'm hoping to address most of them at the end of the talk, but if something is really relevant and, and pressing, I'll try to weave that in. Uh, and we're also going to be recording this discussion, so um, you know you'll be able to watch it later, share it with friends on Instagram and YouTube. Um, so back to you, Rochelle. The the big question: um, abstraction. Why? Well, I think I think what you're, if I can get under what you're asking, uh, is 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 that why did I choose um, to work abstractly, or to choose that as a, a dynamic uh, for for my work rather than choosing perhaps in my generation, other, um, other kind of types or motifs uh, or camps or um, styles of painting. So I think for me, the, the notion of, uh, of abstraction, geometric abstraction in particular, which has been my, my main interest, um, was to um, figure out how I can uh, insert, you yeah, know, that's um, the weak and hate. Um, not insert, but in, in a sense, record something which is quite ordinary uh, within, to the, with, within, to the form, within the formal structure of abstraction, which is basically, you know, or in the interest that I had at the time, gridded. So this goes back 35 years. Uh, so why not abstraction would be my question. And why not feminist abstraction? And why not, why not? Uh, and uh, I'm interested as well in the concrete or language. As you see there, there's a curtain uh, made up of um, all these very commonly used phrases that I'm collecting all the time. Uh, and uh, they're kind of enigmatic phrases. And so abstraction itself seems to me um, a form, it seems a form that why not? Uh, why not use, you know, investigate abstraction? I also thought it was the most um, authoritarian form that I could possibly choose to kind of push against, to say, okay, you know, sure, I can, let's do something. 
Um, I was told long ago that I wasn't part of painting culture because of the kind of work I did. So I'm very happy to say I think painting culture has changed quite a bit. But what, what do you mean by authoritarian there? I, I don't understand. Authorial is really the word. I'm oh, sorry, authorial. Okay, okay. My mistake. Yeah, uh, more authorial. Well, because of the representation of what was presumed post-abstraction uh, to be um, a, a sign system um, that was not representational. It didn't uh, kind of, wasn't subjective in terms of producing an image that was uh, from life, taken from life. It wasn't photographic, so it was not mechanically reproduced, but it was based upon principles uh, which uh, were responses to very real situations. Not, well, perhaps even pandemic situations. If you look at post-war abstraction uh, after 1918, um, you actually see a rise of abstraction um, as a, a way of making things which don't replicate the condition, but approach a condition in a different way. And I'm interested in conditions. Conditions. The, um, I, you have a collection of essays um, called Please Reply um, that, uh, that you sent me and, and that I really enjoyed going through. Um, they're, you're a beautiful writer in addition to um, the visual art. Uh, and I was struck by a phrase from a relatively early essay included in that collection, I think from 1993, where you write about the inadequacy of abstraction. Um, and I'm wondering if you could explain what you mean by that. Um, does that phrase still ring true to you today? Well, um, that's, a, that's a stolen phrase. <laughs> and so I hope I pointed that out. Um, yes. Uh, and the phrase actually it was it was taken from an interview that years ago that Benjamin Booklow held with uh, Gerhard Richter, and I think the quote I'm maybe misquoting uh, Benjamin Booklow, but I believe he he made a statement talking about Richter. Richter had said he assumed Richter had said uh, that abstraction was impossible, and and so Richter corrected him and said, "No, I didn't say it was impossible. I said it was inadequate." And, and I think, I, you know, I, I've been thinking about it. Um, I've been thinking about it for quite a while, and particularly now, why would somebody want to do something that's just adequate? <laughs> uh, I think that inadequacy leaves room. Uh, it leaves room to not make adequate, to make different, to make understood, to make expressive, to, uh, to make meaning. Uh, and if something were adequate, well, there you have it. <laughs> so, it, it's, it doesn't seem to be a stirring concept. <clears throat> and so this inadequacy left a door open uh, for many people, not just myself. I think of other you know, artists who uh, saw abstraction as Mary Hallman, for example, I mean, to, to somebody that comes to mind, um, that the, um, the kind of exuberance or the joy or the invention that can happen with an abstraction uh, uh, is an opportunity. I mean, why not take it? So the fact that it's inadequate for our generation, or for this generation, uh, seems to me um, kind of like a, a key word. Yeah. Actually, we have one of these um, pressing and relevant questions that just popped up on the Q&A box. So I'll go over it now. And uh, Amy Gibson is asking, or she's saying, I, I don't really understand what is meant by saying, why not abstraction? Um, could we go over this a little bit more and, and probe the meaning of that phrase? Sure. Thank you, Amy Gibson. It, it makes it sound a little arbitrary, potentially, that uh, you chose to work in abstraction. So, so what do you mean by why not? Uh, I, <laughs> I wanted to be a painter. And I think that there were um, minimal choices uh, at the time that I had the realization that I wanted to be a painter and not other things. And for me, it was a choice that took quite a long time to make because I was doing other things. And um, the why not abstraction is that I, I did not choose to make work that, and I may step on some toes here, which is not intentional. It sounds like a judgment, but it's not. But I, I really, I wanted to see what was possible through a language of form uh, to create, in a sense, um, even empathy 
through the reconfiguration of forms with subject matter. And I thought, why not bring subject matter into abstraction? So there we have it. So we, uh, that may not be satisfying an answer. Uh, that, this is a piece, for example, um, it's a three part piece. It's, this is, I don't know if this is the painting or the photograph. Uh, there, that's the photograph. Um, and then there's a third part to it. I mean, why, why do anything and why not do anything? I, it also seemed to me it was a painting uh, abstractly, uh, offered limits and I like limits. And if the field was wide open to me and I could say I can paint anything about me and I wasn't interested in painting my story or my personal narrative, I felt that I was a person in the world and I could choose from a world of options uh, and still work abstractly, which seemed to me a dominant form. And I was interested in not dominating the form, but in entering. It really wasn't a place that was a comfortable place, particularly for women. So this is, these are three parts. The piece is called Who Cares? The first one is a painting that's actually made to look like an abstract painting. And I suppose it is. It has a lot of material attached to it. It uses various uh, kind of acts of pouring and tipping and gluing and things like that. Then I- so Would you say this is an abstract painting in quotation marks or is this authentically abstract expressive in, in a, um, a certain post-war mode? No, I wouldn't say the latter. I, I don't think it's, I don't feel it's expressive. I think it represents an abstract painting. And it's also materially an abstract painting. This, however, is a photograph that's done almost the same size, um, which is almost a, you know, it's a pixel, it's a digital print. Um, and this is the second iteration. And I have a larger question here. And this is the third iteration, which is a desaturated, <clears throat> the desaturated image. And it's made into the pixels are converted into halftone dots which are uh, the mode of reproduction, were the mode of reproduction for old media. And that's a whole other topic about old media, new media, or any media, uh, whether that's relevant or not. But the title of this piece is Who Cares? And who cares if it's an abstract painting? Who cares if it's a photograph? Who cares if it's even news? Uh, it all seems to go by the wayside at some point. And, and I, I'm interested in those questions um, that occur about medium, but that's not all I'm interested in. Um, but what, what gives value? Uh, I mean, I did a whole project called The Estate of Rochelle F, which asked that question. Uh, what, uh, what confers value upon anything? Um, so this Who Cares project, um, for me, was a very, it was also the title of the show in 2017. Um, and it became a very vital part of my, my practice. And since I was working with color wheels, heart shapes, that this became just abstraction, became another form to work with. So to me, it was a form, it represents a form. Did I answer anything? I think you did. I don't know if Amy gets I, mean, I, I think, like I said, I, it's, it was a bigger question. I, th I thought we were gonna have more of a, a warm up until we got to the, the huge questions about abstraction, but, um, but it, it's all I think right. we're warmed up. <laughs> and we'll, we'll circle back around it. Um, yeah. You know, I, I, I think, um, you know, I mentioned your collection of essays and you have been writing alongside your visual art practice for some time. Um, and, and I wanted to um, ask about the relationship between painting and, and language. Uh, and there's a great quote I wanted to highlight, um, again, from a, a 1996 essay where you write, the challenge is to fuse the word into a completely visual and material experience of a painting. And hopefully, create the equivalent of Franglish, in my case, Pinklish. <laughs> I do believe that painting language has soft boundaries. I'm intrigued by the possibility of using words as elastically as paint while employing their demotic power to be concrete, metaphoric, and swift. Um, so that's a, a quote from you from 1996. So I'm curious, have you developed this Pinklish language does it exist in written words? Does it exist on the canvas? Both. I mean, it's this, this combination of, it's listening. I mean, I, I, I have a very bad ear for music. 
uh, I, you know, terrible, like, you know, tone deaf, but I have an ear for um, phrases, for how we speak to each other. Uh, to me, that's uh, um, this, this way in which we speak is those are the things, that's the language that I'm writing down. Um, for example, can I, it, the piece on the right, for example, the phrase, who cares, is the other piece. This one is color therapy. Uh, I mean, color therapy is something, it's, it's not, it, I wouldn't call it uh, painkillish, but it's, it's a commonly held notion of a thing that there's no real uh, kind of definition for what that is, although it's studied, it's written about, but it's not empirical knowledge. And for me, the fact that it's not empirical knowledge, and it's also something which implies something that we all sort of need to think about right now, socially and culturally, uh, which is color, which is the topic we're kind of like, the, the kind of just current events of the last 200 years, um, is something that we're kind of constantly um, struggling with. Um, and so this notion of taking a concept of color therapy and then trying to kind of deal with the painting, uh, which uses the color wheel as a form, and then really fucking that up, uh, is, 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 is like, that's the way I can deal with, with how, in painting, um, this whole issue of, of color and color therapy, and therapy itself uh, as a, a kind of boondoggle for what, in fact, should be done here. So, so the phrase itself, I mean, these, um, the way I think about language, and I use it consistently um, because language has often has a very um, has multiple and complex meanings and painting can mean complexly also uh, as a cognitive and perceptual experience so it's those kind of pairings that are meshings that i trying to play with are you are you writing something now Absolutely um, not. I can't even <laughs> read. I can't even read at this moment. <laughs> the, the title of the book, "Please Reply." I always wrote when I, um, when I thought that I had something to say, and so that's why the title. Hence, something called to me, and I felt I had to reply to some condition uh, in writing, and so that's hence that title. So there's a bookmark in it that's called "Errata." So you just forgive me. Everything is all a mistake anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> Now, um, you mentioned um, the specific choices you made as a woman painter entering the art world, choosing abstraction as a, um, a formal vehicle. And, and so I, I would like to ask about the feminist politics of your work um, and how you see that operating. Um, but I thought maybe a way to do that would be by asking you about um, representations of masculinity uh, in, in your art. Um, I was struck by some of the, the references to men that, that pop up either in, in titles or in photographs that you've reproduced somehow, uh, O.J. Simpson, for example, or, or Michael Jackson, or it feels like Trump is hanging over um, certain aspects of the work as well. Yeah, uh, um, yeah I, I think that my, I, I, I have to phrase it this way. Um, I, I, can, I can speak about my, myself as a woman. I can speak about myself as a feminist. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say I am a feminist artist uh, because every time I, I've gotten into this situation constantly where it becomes framed as that is what I do. And so I do think of myself and I have as a citizen, a citizen artist. And I am absolutely a feminist. And, um, and I the O.J. Simpson, the piece was not titled O.J. Simpson. I mean, I, I was watching something on TV, which was the car chase uh, uh, that was televised. And, and it struck me that the overhead, the aerial views uh, were very much like looking at a Barnett Newman painting and an abstraction. So I started dealing with, with that um, from the point of view of recording a specific event. The piece was called El Bronco a specific event, which was not necessarily about his masculinity, but it was also about mass eyeballs, about some significant event that took place in the culture, uh, which to me is, is you know, as, as, as rich a place to, to be, and I don't censor myself with any of this, really, I try not to, 
um, as is my own personal life, uh, which, in which there have been ways in which um, there have been references. Michael Jackson, I would say that was really a remark he made, which was after he dangles his child over the balcony in Berlin, he said, I made a terrible mistake. Now that struck me also as a phrase. Uh, because we all make terrible mistakes. Now people don't really even say they made mistakes. They just go on and just lie about it. Um, but there was a time where politicians in particular, but we all do. So apologies uh, don't come easily. I'm sorry is rarely heard. So it wasn't Jackson. Jackson was a springboard for thinking about making mistakes, which then in turn, I made mistakes in the work. I tried to make as many mistakes as I could uh, in constructing over 36 pieces over a two year period of time. And then Barry White entered into this thing, but it's a longer story. But masculinity, I don't know anything about masculinity. Um, you know about masculinity. Um, I, know, I, know about, um, I know about culture. And I know, um, I'm certainly aware of patriarchal culture um, and I'm aware of the pedagogy of the patriarchy. And um, so, I mean, my approach is really as just a human being who's um, trying to really make note of a, number of things that happened over a course of years, and now it's 30 years. So there's quite a collection of events, both significant and insignificant, because those happen all at once, like life. Do you think there's something inherently patriarchal about um, the vocabulary of abstract painting? Oh God, I hate that question. <laughs> <laughs> no, not inherently, but the people making all the art, you know, up yeah. until 20th century or recognized we're all men. So, I mean, it's, 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 so it became that. Um, I mean, you're seeing, of course, the, um, you know, the, the, the emergence of, of, of artists uh, right now, who, some of them in their 90s or 100, who, women artists who are being recognized, been working throughout this whole period. Actually, an old friend of mine died quite recently, uh, Zarina. Uh, Zarina worked for years, toiled for years, being under, unrecognized. Uh, and only in the last few years of her life, um, she received uh, acknowledgement. Uh, so uh, this comes from a whole power structure, and which I don't prefer not. We don't. Everyone talks about that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but. Can I ask a question that might be more enjoyable then, which is about um, the role of humor in your work? I mean, I think there's something. You know, I, I think we could talk about the sort of con conceptual dynamics of, of your paintings, but at the end of the day, they are very funny, or a lot of them are, where you can stand in front of an abstract painting and, and laugh. Um, and, and so I, I wonder, you know, why, why make a, a, a funny painting, um, and especially an abstract funny painting? Well, I mean, I, you know, I, I kind of make myself, I mean, I make myself kind of, I put myself out there as a subject you know, at times. So I'm the, I'm the butt of the joke, I mean, you know, often, but I don't intend to make jokes. Um, but I, I think that, you know, humor is, humor is um, I don't know that I'm funny. I like to think of it as wit, not witty, but that somehow the operation of you know, all the faculties are all working. It, something can be both um, funny and awful at the same time, uh, that these kind of, uh, this kind of bifurcated experience meets in front of an object or meets through an object. Um, uh, so, I mean, there's one painting I did a long time ago, uh, which was called Nude Model, and it was from a Craigslist ad in which someone had advertised, uh, he wanted a, a nude model to make an abstract painting. And, and I thought that was a very challenging <laughs> idea. <laughs> so it took me years. I sometimes hang on to this stuff for a long time. But I ended up making a painting in which very, very, very deliberately, uh, it used a lot of different elements, but if you're going to, in the convention of Western painting, a nude model would necessarily have been white as the acceptable nude model. So it ended up being basically a white on white painting. Mm. With Trump Loy and with the, so it's, and I don't know if that's, it's funny, but it also represents a condition, uh, which, uh, which is the condition. No. And the funny, yeah, um, maybe puzzling. I'm trying to think of a funny work I've done. Well, I, I mean, the, the color wheel therapy is pretty funny. Oh, oh, that. 
Well, yeah, well, there are, well, there are colors included there that are not included in the standard color wheel. So, yeah. And it does spin around and go crazy. And it is, it has abrasiveness. There's an abrasive element in it. I mean, the actual material. Mm -hmm. There's um, uh, uh, glass particles that are in it. So that it's, uh, there's, a, there's an interruption of the, uh, the synchronous, synchronicity of color, the analogous color, everything is interrupted. And, and then, so that's, yeah. Now, now I do want to talk about the, um, the other images that you sent, the ones yeah. that aren't funny. Um, these uh, plein air paintings? Yes, yes. yes. What, what, what does the title mean? Um, I mean, I know uh, what it means, but I'm, I'm curious what it means to you. <laughs> well, I, I've been um, in, I think, the previous images. Uh, I've been thinking about um, and collecting um, the, a lot of um, language, uh, the uh, US patent plans for Amazon for their new Melancov-like structure that they want to use as drone structure for cities. I've been interested in the phenomena and the business and the corporatization of Amazon not the Amazon, but Amazon the company. And so I've been thinking about this for quite some time and working with cardboard indirectly um, and doing a lot of work with images of sites for sale for big box stores and just the shift of the economy and the landscape and, and Amazon has kind of gobbled up everything and we know that now more than, than ever. So this, um, I was in Rome for a year at the American Academy and I realized that everything that I was getting, all the materials I was getting and other people were getting came via Amazon. So I started inverting the boxes and collecting the boxes. And I had a, many, many of these boxes. This is also, these are the, the, these are the line, visual merchandisers, uh, sortation associate on the right. Uh, this is the kind of corporate language um, that uh, Amazon has adapted uh, from kind of the, basically the creative, uh, the creative sector. Uh, into their corporation. So I've been working with these boxes and with cardboard. And so at one point I realized that I needed, I had a beautiful floor. You can see a little bit of it there, a terrazzo floor at the American Academy. Thank you, American Academy. Um, and I needed to cover it. So I ordered a very large drop cloth from Amazon and I opened it up and I realized that I could make a painting out of that and that I needn't use it as a drop cloth, but the fact that I was interested in Amazon and used the material that came from Amazon for a work became a, a, a really compelling thought. That plain air is that plain air painting in the uh, 19th century, uh, the advent of plain air painting existed because of uh, technology. Basically, you could have tube paint. paint. You could travel with paint in tubes, and all these painters could go out into the countryside and be able to paint plain air. And so I thought plein air um, became, uh, for me, the kind of MO that I used for these works, which are still ongoing. And so that's plein air one and two. Um, and the one on the left is, um, that's, oh. the, that's, that's plein air. Plein air one is on the left, plein air two is on the right. Um, they relate to other paintings I've been doing with the palette, but I realized that I was working in a palette that basically looked like camouflage and they were used that palette of camouflage. So plein air one on the left um, is a, a painting with that palette. The one on the right uh, is the 19, uh, it was from the Iraq war 2003. Uh, the, uh, the armed forces routinely changed their uniform patterning of camouflage with each, uh, with each war, with each war front. Uh, so plein air, Two on the right is from the Desert Storm palette. Um, I'm working on three and four now in the studio, which are um, plein airs, uh, and they're based on uh, the red and blue of the voting maps that we use now, which create purple. So mm -hmm. there's an image somewhere in that group of things I sent. So I'm working on a new current, they're eight, eight, eight by 11 feet and they're really out of the box. I love the idea of the mobility of them. Plain air also, you could travel. So mm -hmm. you can see the, the fold marks in them. Uh, I'm interested in making work now. I'm so tired of, I mean, I love, you know, like everybody needs a job and I want everybody to get back to work. But for me, I mean, the complication of uh, the handling, the shipping, the packing, 
and all the plastic and I mean, <laughs> all this excess. And this, I just fold up and put in a suitcase and I go. And so I love the idea of just taking it with me to, and it's, it's been shown a few different versions of it in different places. So um, I'm really going to continue working in this way also with the cardboard. And uh, do you just tell customs that it's simply a drop cloth and not to worry about it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And, and that's the, yeah, so this is it with another piece with a sculpture of mine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I also wanted to ask about the um, your collaborative working process, um, and in particular, um, a recent project that you've done with Ulrika Muller. Um, that's this is the newspaper project, correct? No, that 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 preceded this. Yeah, the newspaper project was uh, through the the Basel Zeitung. The, they're doing a they did a commission project. Yeah. I see. Okay. Yeah. And so, uh, so could yeah. you tell me about the, the collaborative? Yes, I'd love to. Yes. Um, uh, the, the collaboration is we're sort of in the middle of it now. Uh, and it's with, um, I'm working in Ulrike Muller invited me to collaborate when I was very happy to as a project, which is sponsored by the, uh, Austrian, uh, cultural forum. And I think they've invited, um, 10 or 12 Austrian artists to work with, American artists, and it's not only visual, but there are um, composers and writers, and etc. It's a whole field of kind of uh, creative actors which are involved in this. So Ulrika and I realized that we had some common ground, and the collaboration. Uh, we we have keywords we're working with, and we're, I'm working from home. I haven't, I don't have a studio, so things are pretty compact. And she's going to her studio not all the time, but occasionally. But um, we're working, her, her key words were animals and architecture, and mine are cardboard and rainbows. And we're working on a collaborative project. Uh, each piece will be essentially the same modular size, and we'll be doing a number of them, and then breaking it up, and we're going to be making into this big quilt out of this cardboard. And it's very exciting. That sounds really good. I'm going to um, take some of the great questions that we've been getting throughout Please the do. talk. Yeah. Um, Okay, well, the, the first one from uh, Jacqueline said, asks, uh, can color be a, a propagandalist agent provocateur? It seems like a very specific question, but um, um, I suppose, yeah, is there an element of color that uh, acts like an agent provocateur? Uh, well, color is a wide range. Is there some specific, I, I'm sorry, we're doing this virtually. Um, color is provocateur, sure. I mean, I don't, I'm not a provocateur, so I don't know how I would quite do that. Uh, <laughs> it didn't, it wouldn't really uh, occur to me, but um, I mean, color, color signifies. I mean, it's, it's, it's perceptual, but it also is in the world. So, I mean, the color red, I don't know what that means, the color yellow. I, you know, I, there are, um, I think it depends upon who's looking and in what culture you're existing within and what culture and what audience you're trying to, to communicate to. Um, I mean, color is, I mean, it, it just, it's saturate. I mean, it, 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 it operates in a way which isn't purely alone. It's, it's, it's maybe in reference to another color. It's, in, it's a reference to the space that you're in as an architecture. Uh, so I don't have a, a precise answer for that, but I'm not, I'm not interested in the kind of provocateurness of it. Um, I'm interested more in, in, in form, yeah. I guess on, on that note, uh, Ronald Hall asks, can an abstract painting be narrative? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a great question. Um, yes, I, I think that it, the idea of narrative seems to me uh, a, in a way quite, quite singular and the expectation is that there is a story which is expositive. I mean, so it, it, it's a way of telling a story which has different parts. Uh, I, my way of dealing with narrative, uh, because I am interested in narrative, which has parts that are in conversation with each other, is I work in these multiple units. So I don't work frequently only in a single image, that the image is a diptych or a polytych, and that the grammar, it has grammar. I think of all these multiple paintings that I do together uh, as sharing, like who cares, share a grammar. And that grammar, a painting, a photograph, and then a desaturated photograph that's configured in a very different way is, in a sense, a narrative. If you put the parts together, it is a narrative. Yes. 
but I don't think it has a, a story arc to it necessarily. I think it, 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 it speaks to something. Uh, it, it kind of speaks to itself in a way that speaks to its mode, mode of making. It's a very, very interesting answer. A, a narrative without a story arc. Um, or when, you, when you show that work, are all three parts together? Are they separate? Or how, how have you installed that in the past? Thank you for that question. And thank you for the, whoever asked the narrative question, because it's really a very important one to me. Uh, no, who cares is my answer. I wanted to do a piece where I could actually say, who cares? So what I've done with that piece, because it's digital also, um, there have been occasions uh, which uh, people have wanted something. Uh, I mean, Georgia, Georgia Segri and Fabrice Strun had a great project in Athens um, about two years ago. Uh, and they were, I mean, they were just like broke, no money for anything. And this is very deliberate on my part. I wanted to make a painting that was existed as a file. And that file could be reproduced anywhere by anyone. And so what I gave to them were two files. The only conditions were that it was that it would be printed out on canvas and it would have to be the same size. They would say, okay, how do we put it in the wall with nails, with grommets? I said, who cares? Who cares? I wanted to do something that let go of this notion and mm -hmm. continue the narrative into the world. And if you sold the painting, then I would get, you know, whatever percentage, would not for profit, profit, whatever it was. And if you didn't sell it, you could keep the print. It's yours, but the printer made money. So the printer received a fee. And so we did the same thing in, uh, in Munich, in the Christine Mayer Gallery uh, for another exhibition where um, I sent them the files and we had this back and forth. And I said, who cares? I'd like to be, for me, the narrative is make it a file, let it go. And that is, and I hope that story can keep living as long as I have my two conditions, because I'd like the painting to have both value and no value. I mean, we've been talking about you as a painter, as an abstract painter, and those are some of the first terms that come to mind when I think about your work. But I mean, do you really identify as a, a painter to that extent? It seems like you're also interested in I mean, I guess you could call yourself a conceptualist, but you are a sculptor. You're working with what used to be called new media. Um, you're thinking about networks and distribution channels as, as maybe as much as the um, creation of the work itself, or is that an overstatement? No, I think it's a, I think it's a, it's a workable statement. Uh, I think it's, it's been pretty operational uh, for me. Um, yes. Uh, I mean, because I have always, from the time I think I, not always, but from the time I realized what I did not want to put in my painting, it allowed me to introduce all sorts of other things that were non-painting non material into the painting, into the world of painting, mm -hmm. and have this collaboration happen between painting and other things. But they, they make a new uh, kind of, uh, a new life together. Mm -hmm. So yes, so I think it's, it's, it's a lot of those, those things that are, to me, they're simultaneous. I mean, I have to find the best possible way to um, figure out um, how the thing can be made. I think conceptual, we're all conceptual. We all conceptualize. Even if we're not making something, we have to stand in front of it and believe it in some way. Um, and, so, and so how do you do that? You, um, you said something really interesting at the beginning of the talk, which is that you're interested in conditions. Um, and and I, I think that's really meaningful in relation to what you've just been describing about um, um, you know, the different ways of working with painting and how you can allow sort of the world into it. Um, I, I guess I wonder specifically about the condition of the pandemic and how you're responding to that. Has it changed your working process, your routine? Um, how are you coping with this um, condition around us? Well, you know, it's a, it's, it's a struggle. Uh, I, the piece that you first showed that was in the Basel of Zeitung, it was really, it was a photograph I'd taken of a missing cat, a cat that was missed. Uh, and and this, this was published in, on April 30th, so we were well into uh, into uh, the coronavirus, then uh, mine is the piece on the right. And so it was an image that I had, and, and the rainbow's in there. I mean, it was a, 
it was a degraded image because of, it, it had been rained on, but somebody missed their cat. I actually knew who the cat was. I knew the cat it was in Rome. And I hung on to this thing for two years, not knowing what to do with it. When I had the invitation to do something for the newspaper, I remembered this piece and I, I thought it, it's titled Mist, not missing, but the English word is used in this as mist. And I thought, I now know what to do with this image. Uh, and I, and it is, it is about this missed cat that was always been missing and it's, and it's totally degraded. And the strange thing about this, and this is, I find for me, serendipity is a huge part of my process. I feel like if I wait long enough, I find a match. I find a match for something. This was published opposite. I did not plan the page. It's opposite my image, which is about a pandemic that's killing birds. And that was not the choice of the art, of the art editor either. It just happened to lay out that way. So this way of addressing everything that's missed and the things that are now going missing um, is a very poignant um, uh, event um, that just ended up facing pages. How this pandemic is affecting me? Well, um, cardboard. <laughs> you know, part of this project that Ulrika and I are working on, it's called, uh, forgive me guys if I can't get it right, uh, no, no place or a place in the future or no place but the future. There's something to do with the future. And I keep thinking the future is cardboard with all the deliveries we're getting, how the world is changing, how we're affected, not solely by the morbidity and, um, and the long-term disease and the second wave and the third wave, uh, but also how we're, how we're dealing with our material worlds uh, are changing so drastically. And so what I started three years ago with this Amazon project, purely being interested in how they were taking over uh, kind of this kind of drone-like, uh, uh, robotic, uh, this kind of uh, disenfranchised labor uh, occurring, uh, and the architecture as well, is now seems to me, I, my interest in cardboard is just maximal. Uh, and, uh, and I'm also working in ceramics, uh, which are imprints of, of cardboard as artifacts. So yeah, it's affected me a lot to a great deal, but I feel like I'm, I'm in my moment in a strange way. Um, that, I, the material, I'm, if I could only get to my studio, I'd be a lot happier, um, much happier. But I, I think that it's never, it's, it's much on my mind. Um, there are these other fulfillment pieces I'm working with that sh um, I think you have some of those there. I don't know, I think you may, it's in the viewing room. Um, um. But that's a piece where the language itself, because the uh, big box stores, the Amazon stores, they're all called fulfillment centers. And that phrase caught me as fulfillment. Like what could that possibly mean? Certainly not robots uh, getting staples off shelves. Um, so, yeah, fulfillment, you know, Evan um, asked the question, um, as, as language is so generative to your work and you are so finely attuned to mass media, are there any words, phrases, idioms, quotes, et cetera, that have really, really stuck with you um, over the last few months specific to the pandemic? I, I think you've answered that in a certain way, talking about mist uh, as a phrase and fulfillment as another. Yeah. Um, but I'm curious if there's anything else, because I think, yeah. it's, um, I think Evan really characterizes your relationship to language and the media very yeah. well there. Yes, yes. Yeah, he does. Um, hi, Evan. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I think there's a, an image taken from my desktop when I left the studio, and it's a word, um, it was, I read an article, um, maybe in The Guardian or somewhere, um, and it was about how language is used, there's a kind of way, it's, it's, it's kind of this franglish, anglish thing, but it's actually, a, it's a word that demonstrates that, and that caught me, and it, it really, it signifies this moment, and um, it's a cross between the kind of the happy and the sad, the kind of like, the, the awful, the, you know, the, the, the terror, terror and, and release. And the word that caught me in this article was apocalypso. And so it's a combination of apocalypse and calypso and it's put together. And so you have this very unsteady uh, nature of, of what that might mean, but it's not all bad. It's a little good. 
And so, um, and so that's, it's, that was the last thing that I drew out on the table. I think you have an image of that that I sent. That's one, I think there are others, but, uh, oh, oh yeah, <laughs> that's for my project with Ulrika. That's life. <laughs> Rather than having people uh, look at my desktop for a while as I search around for this, I, I think that might be a great place to end it actually on the apocalypso note, um, because I, I think that is a really poignant phrase for what we're all experiencing. I wanted to um, thank you, Rochelle, for this oh. great conversation today. This was a lot of fun. I think I speak for everyone who was listening in. This was um, really uh, a pleasure to learn more about your work and especially your recent work. Uh, and I really do want to suggest that everyone check out the online viewing room at uh, Speroni Westwater because it's um, a really beautiful, well contextualized presentation of a lot of the work that we were discussing here today. Um, so, um, so yeah, please do yourselves a favor and check that out.